The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. It happens this show date falls on September 6th, 2021, just a year since the death of my first wife, whose name was Allison. In my work as a hospital chaplain, I often heard family members say they hoped for a sign, some indication that their deceased relative was indeed alive and blessed in the sea of light and love we know as God. Some folks even went to mediums hoping for some after-death communication and words to reassure themselves. Sometimes I would suggest they instead just say a prayer on behalf of their departed or even better, have a one-way conversation about what's going on with them in their lives right now. I would assure them they'd be heard, not only by the departed, but by God as well. The thing is, the language on that side of the veil is not so much said in words as channeled through God's love and spoken in the timeless now that contains all history. Becoming aware of that is really all we need to keep in touch. It's in that spirit, then, that I'm going to read a story I wrote several years ago about a time when Allison and I were raising our kids on a farm in Maine. This is a story I wrote for those kids, Matthew and Kristen, about a bronze bell from France, perhaps some three centuries old, that crossed our path for a moment in our lives on its way to becoming a church bell once again. I titled this story, A Bell for Castine. In a pretty main village on the Penobscot Bay shore, a bronze bell hangs in the archway of a chapel known as Our Lady of Holy Hope Church. The archway is not very high. In fact, visitors can grasp the clapper and ring the bell for themselves. But the story of how the bell came to be there reaches all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to France and back in time by more than two centuries. By now, many of the details of the story have been long forgotten. Still, it's fun to imagine the parts of the story we don't know for sure. A long, long time ago, a bellmaker received an order to make a bronze bell for a little village church in France. Bronze was an expensive metal in those days, and the village was poor. But with a good fall harvest of grapes for wine and wheat for bread, there was enough money left for a Christmas gift for the whole village a bell to hang in the church steeple. All the townspeople contributed as much as they could, for they said to one another, oh, what's a church without a bell to ring for Sunday Mass, and especially at Christmas? A bell is the heart of a village in France, the sweet voice that calls out to mourn or to dance, and tells us by morning to awake and to pray, matins and evensong, night into day. Perhaps a wealthy patron, the lord of some nearby chateau, also helped pay for the bell. After all, bells ring out for rich and poor alike. But the bell of this story is not large, like some majestic cathedral bells, which can be taller than a tall man. No, this bell stood no taller than a French poodle, which is why I think it was made to ring mainly for the ears of the poor. Nevertheless, when it was properly mounted in its little steeple, Despite its size, it was loud enough to be heard throughout the entire village. But we're getting ahead of our story. Just where the bell was made has been forgotten, and the name of the bellmaker too, but for the sake of the story, let's say his name was Jacques. To create the sweet tone befitting his reputation, Jacques had to cast the bell as a single piece from bottom to top. First, a mold of the bell was fashioned, and then the bronze was heated molten hot. Thinking about it, you can almost see the blackened walls of the foundry, lighted only by the red-hot flames under the boiling cauldron. A young apprentice worked the bellows, blowing the flames even hotter, while Jacques's red face sweated from his forehead to his beard as he struggled to align the mold for the liquid bronze he was about to pour. I am Jacques, the bell I make. With fire and smoke, for heaven's sake, I fashion voices like angels on high that ring from steeples and fill the sky. At last, the bronze filled the mold and was allowed to cool. 
When the mold was opened, the bell was born, and with it, its bold, sweet voice. Am I a bell or am I a voice? As I think on it, do I have a choice? I shine like gold and I curve with grace. If you look very close, you may see my face. But I think that my fate is to hide away in a steeple tall where the pigeons play. The bell ringer's rope will hang from me so they'll hear my beauty but never see. Is it presuming too much to think the bell would care? After all, bells sing with joy for weddings and celebrations and with sorrow at funerals and Good Friday prayers. To our ears, it seems they know what they're saying, so perhaps they do care as well. When the bell had cooled, Jacques cleaned and polished the bronze to a gleam. He mounted an iron clapper inside and packed the bell in a wooden crate for the wagon ride to the village. So the bell came home, and the villagers rejoiced to think their church was at last complete. Proudly, the bell ringer pulled the rope, and from morning services to evening prayers, the bell told the times and seasons, baptisms and deaths, the end of wars, and the birth of children. Because the French were America's allies during our revolution against England, the bell may have rung it to celebrate America's freedom in 1776. And no doubt somebody rang the bell on July 14th, 1789, Bastille Day, when the French began their revolution against the king. I ring for births and I ring for time. I ring for prayer and for victory. But for freedom, I ring especially loud, for in its heart, a bell is free. But freedom can be a mixed blessing, for as the king fell from favor, people also turned away from praying to God. Their revolution grew increasingly dangerous, and many good people were put to death. Priests were killed, and without them, the churches were abandoned. Some buildings began to fall apart, since no one thought to repair the roof of a church without a priest. And the bell was rung less and less often. But then something even worse happened in the little village, and for that matter, throughout France. A terrible war spread across the land, and everything that could be used to make weapons was taken by the army. Metal to make guns and bullets was in short supply, and soldiers went from village to village with horse-drawn carts, searching through houses and shops, and taking whatever they needed for the war effort. They especially wanted bronze, for bronze is used to make guns as well as bells. Statues, machines, candlesticks, and yes, even church bells were taken away and melted down to make cannons. Do you suppose our bell knew about the danger it was in? Flying birds cry of deadly war, and I ring for funerals more and more. Men march to battle past fields of grain and return home wounded and full of pain. Yes, if the bell knew anything, it knew the village was in mourning and full of fear. If ever there was a time the bell was needed, it was now, but soldiers were coming, looking for bronze to melt into guns. What would become of the little bell? And then a kind of miracle happened, just when it was most needed. It seems a young boy, we'll call him Pierre, was now the only bell ringer for all the grown men had gone off to fight. Before the war, Pierre had served as apprentice to a house painter. Now, in those days, painters knew a great deal about painting, more than most know today. They could paint a plastered wall and make it look like inlaid oak, or paint a ceiling to look as if carved angels hovered in the corners. In fact, painters in those days could make almost anything look like something else. And that is what Pierre had learned to do. At first, it made Pierre sad to ring the bell for much of the time it was to tell the village that another friend or neighbor had died in the war. But when he rang the bell for prayers, Pierre could see just how important the little bell could be, for it lifted the hearts of all who heard. It was just a few days before Christmas, and the bell meant everything to the villagers on Christmas Eve. But word had reached town that soldiers were coming with their carts to take away materials for the war especially the bronze. The miracle was Pierre's very own idea. He would paint the bell to look like something else, to look like iron 
instead of bronze. Iron was less valuable to the soldiers, more trouble than it was worth to haul down from the steeple, and they probably leave the bell alone. But to create this disguise would take all of Pierre's skill. To make bronze look like iron takes more than just a little gray paint. The whole texture of iron was different, pitted, rough, homely. Carefully, Pierre assembled all his tools and mixed the thick paint almost like plaster. Yet he couldn't apply it too thickly, for a piece might flake off when the bell was rung, leaving the shiny bronze exposed. If the soldiers discovered his trick, it could mean his life. Each night after the last service, Pierre would climb the rickety ladder within the steeple, his bag of paints and brushes slung over his back. The steeple was shuttered so he could light a single candle without being seen from the street below. There he would work late into the night, shaping the texture of iron from gray lead pigment. He finished up the job in seven nights, and there were seven coats of paint when he was done. Each night after he had finished, while the brushes soaked in turpentine, he would peer out between the louvered shutters at the village below and think about all of the townspeople asleep in their cozy goose-down beds. And he'd smile to think he knew something that no one else in the whole world knew, that he was saving the bell for Christmas. The soldiers' arrival put the town into an uproar. They went from house to house, seizing lead candlesticks, copper basins, and everything made of bronze. One soldier climbed all the way to the top of the rickety steps to look at the bell, for he could not believe so sweet a tone could possibly come from iron. But when he saw it, he knew it was iron. After all, seeing is believing. And so the soldiers came and went, and thanks to Pierre, the bell was saved. The bell rang especially sweetly on that Christmas day. When the war finally ended, the people all rejoiced, and their bell rang and rang. But now a different problem faced the village. More and more, it seemed, village children no longer wanted to grow up to be farmers like their parents. Instead, they left the village for the cities, where they went to work in factories and shops and made money instead of bread and wine. The village grew smaller and smaller, until the only people left were old and tired. What war couldn't silence, indifference did. Finally, many years later, the steeple was torn down and the little bell sold to a peddler who took it in his cart to Paris. For the bell, this was an entirely new adventure, traveling to Paris and traveling in disguise. For the bell still looked like iron, so nobody thought of melting it down which would certainly have been the case if they'd known the bell was bronze. Instead, it was sold to a junk shop on a back street in a poor section of Paris, where it sat in a corner, silent and gathering dust. One day, a jolly Hungarian from America, Joseph by name, came to Paris looking for antiques. He had a shop near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and once a year he would travel to Europe to buy chairs and tables, paintings and lamps, to sell to his customers in America. But Joseph had a peculiar habit. He loved to buy interesting things that almost nobody else wanted. As a result, his dark, deep shop was filled to overflowing with stuffed rocking horses, carved animals, strange wooden boxes from the Middle Ages, giant chandeliers, and a million other odds and ends, large and small. His shop was truly a magical place, and people came to look more often than they came to buy. When Joseph saw the bell, he just couldn't resist. It was perfect for his collection, and that's how the bell came to America. Of course, a bell is not truly a bell unless it has a reason to ring, and whether it sat in a shop in Paris or in Pennsylvania, it felt a deep, sad longing to do what it did best. What is a bell except to ring? What is a song except to sing? My reason to be is just as clear as the tone of my voice where people can hear. To make matters worse, it was nearly Christmas. Even so, the bell waited patiently while people came into Joseph's shop to find a present for a friend, a mother, or a son. They'd look at the bell, of course, but nobody wanted it. 
After all, it was just an ugly iron bell, much too big for a doorbell, and yet too small and plain for the grand churches of Philadelphia. And then one day, a young husband and wife came into the shop to look for a gift. As soon as they saw the bell, they knew they wanted it, but they knew something else. Secretly, each one wanted to give it to the other as a Christmas surprise. So they didn't say a word about it to one another, not when they saw it in the shop or later when they got home. The next morning, very early, the husband left for work, but he had a plan. He went straight to the shop and paid Joseph for the bell. And then he said, Joseph, I think my wife may come in today to buy the bell for me. You can tell her you sold it. Please don't tell her you sold it to me. I, I want it to be a Christmas surprise. Joseph promised not to give away the secret. <clears throat> and then Joseph told the husband a secret as well. With a smile on his face, the husband struggled out of the door with the bell and took all his strength to carry it to the car and load it into the trunk. The husband then waited until his wife left the house before he went home. Slowly, carefully, he lifted the bell and carried it into the basement. He was pleased with himself for buying the bell, but he was especially excited by the secret Joseph had told him. It was a hundred-year-old secret that Joseph had discovered and not told anyone else. Take a knife and scrape the bell, Joseph had said, and you will find a wonderful surprise. The husband set the bell on his workbench and unfolded his pocket knife. He scraped the side of the bell, but nothing happened. Pierre had applied the paint so well that no little pocket knife would reveal the secret. The husband then took the sharp end of a screwdriver and scraped the surface again and again, and suddenly the faint glow of the bronze caught and reflected the dim basement light. Meanwhile, the wife went to Joseph's shop to buy the bell for her husband for Christmas. She was terribly disappointed when Joseph told her the bell had been sold. Yet, even as she was leaving the shop, her husband had started the long, slow process of removing the gray paint that Pierre had applied so carefully so many years before. Every night after supper, the husband would go down to the basement. There, with wire brush, paint remover, and steel wool, he'd brush and clean and scrape. Pierre had painted it well, and it took all the nights before Christmas to clean the bell. But when it was done, how it shone. The husband built a wooden tripod stand to hold it, and then on Christmas Eve, after his wife and children were in bed, he carried the bell upstairs and set it next to the Christmas tree. He had to be careful to keep the bell from ringing and giving away the surprise. He tied a red velvet bow on the bell and looked at it for a long while by the flickering light from the fireplace. What a history you must have, Bell, he thought. What stories you could tell of France and the war. I wonder what stories we'll live through together now that you're with us. But he was tired and went to bed and so never listened carefully enough to hear the tale. The bell was thrilled to have those thick coats of paint stripped away, to have its bronze revealed again, to gleam in the light of the dying fire. Sappho, the calico kitten, rubbed against the edge of the bell and purred. Yes, this would be a good place to stay for a while, if only the bell could ring. And yes, the bell did ring the next day when 10-year-old Matthew and 5-year-old Kristen came down the stairs. They were more surprised by the bell than their mother, who probably expected all along the bell would be there. The bell rang more on that Christmas morning than it had in many a year. The bell lived for many years with the family, but its happiest time came when the family bought an old farmhouse in Castine on the coast of Maine. Oh yes, the weather was cold, and the house was old and plain, but they made it into a working farm, and the bell was now a working bell. Hung proudly on the framework of the large back porch, the bell was rung to call Matthew and Kristen when supper was ready. One of Matthew's chores was to milk and feed the goats and to give grain and hay to the horse at the end of the day. Flashlight in hand, he would head to the little barn down the hill between the house and the garden. In the winter, it was cold, and often the water buckets were frozen solid. Then he'd haul warm water from the pot on the kitchen's wood stove to give to the animals. 
on warmer days, he would get water from the bottom of the hill where a little spring managed to flow in all but the coldest weather. But once inside the barn, huddled against a furry goat and listening to the warm milk squirt into the pail, Matthew would sometimes daydream while the other goats butted each other impatiently or teased Kristen's horse in the next stall. The smell of goat, horse, and uh, hay filled the air while the light of a single bulb cast shadows on the animals against the rough wooden walls. It was at times like these that the bell did its work calling Matthew in to supper. Time passes in the blink of an eye. Matthew and Kristen grew up and moved away. The goats and horses were no longer needed and went to other homes. The bell was no longer rung for supper, and it hung silent, neglected, and alone. But in Castine Village, just down the road, there was some excitement in the air. The little Catholic Church, Our Lady of Holy Hope, was about to celebrate an important birthday. It seems the priest, Father Gene Gaffey, was something of an historian. He'd done some research and found that it was 350 years ago that a little Catholic chapel named St. Pierre's had been built by French settlers on the same land where the church now stood. Now, 350 years is a long time in American history, and a big party was planned for the occasion. Even the bishop was coming. But the little church, though it had been there for many years, did not have a bell to ring in celebration. And so the husband and wife decided to give the bell to the church in time for the big celebration. I think it's perfect, the husband said to Father Jean. This bell came from an old French chapel, and now it's back on the site of an old French chapel once again. Coincidentally, the date of the big party was July 14th, 1985, nearly 200 years after the first Bastille Day. You'll remember that July 14th is a date the bell was glad to celebrate, and celebrate it did. I ring for joy. And I ring for time, I ring for prayer and for victory, but for freedom I ring especially loud, for in its heart the spell is free. And to this very day the bell hangs in a little outdoor archway at Our Lady of Holy Hope Church on the shore of Castine, Maine. It hangs facing the islands in a harbor that opens to Penobscot Bay, and it's not hidden away in a steeple tall, but within easy reach of anyone who wants to ring it especially at Christmas. I hope someday you'll have the chance to visit the Castine Bell and share its adventures, for it has many stories to tell, if only you'll stop and listen. So that's where my story ends. This past Sunday, my daughter Kristen and I met in Castine to walk the dogs and visit the bell. And while I attempted to keep the dogs quiet, Kristen rang the bell and recorded it on her phone. If I thought to ask Allison against John Dunn's admonition, for whom the bell tolls, I can imagine a twinkle in her eye and a self-effacing smile responding, why, it tolls for me. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 400 archived NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button. Or subscribe to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can listen and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to like, follow, and share our new NDE radio Facebook page and discover our Facebook group and links to our YouTube channel while you're there. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app with your desktop or mobile device. And listen again Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.